The Earth rotates on its axis. Therefore, you can think of the Earth as a gyroscope. Therefore, the question then becomes the following. Does that gyroscope process? Now, I'm talking about the Earth's rotation. I'm not talking about its orbital motion. We already know from my lecture on Kepler's second law, for example, that the sun's gravity does not exert an external torque upon a planet as the planet orbits the sun. This then leads to Kepler's second law and blah, blah, blah. So we're talking about the rotation here, not the orbital motion. Okay, now let's see what happens with respect to the sun's gravitational force exerted upon the Earth if we first of all picture the Earth as a perfect sphere. Okay, so the Earth is a gyroscope. In other words, it rotates on its axis. Does that gyroscope process? Does the Earth process? Okay, well, first of all, let's picture the Earth as a perfect sphere. Let's assume a perfectly spherical Earth. Okay, so if I make that assumption, then what happens? Okay, well, let me go ahead and draw the Earth like so. I'm going to draw it nice and large, like this. Okay, so right here is the Earth's equator, like so. Here's the center of the Earth. Let's say right here is the North Pole, right here is the South Pole. Okay, let me go ahead and draw in the Earth's axis of rotation, like so. And then as the Earth rotates from west to east on this diagram, let me extend this out a little bit like so, the rotation would be like this. Okay, now the Earth's axis is tilted with respect to the ecliptic, the plane of the Earth's orbit about the sun. So let me go ahead and draw in the ecliptic like this, like so. So the sun is off in this direction, some distance are away. Okay, now the angle that the Earth's axis is tilted on this diagram is 23 and a half degrees. Here's how you can visualize that angle pretty easily. Okay, so right here, for example, is the radius of the Earth here and also here on this side of the diagram as well. And then right here, this red angle like so, this is the angle theta in question. This is the tilt of the Earth's axis of rotation. It's basically the same as the Earth's angle that the equator makes with respect to the ecliptic. This angle here is 23 and a half degrees. And it's that 23 and a half degree tilt which ultimately gives us our description of the seasons. I'll give you a basic run through of that using this light bulb and this ball here in just a little while. However, let's go ahead and answer this question. Does the Earth persist? So we're gonna assume a perfectly spherical Earth. Now we have the sun's gravitational force exerted upon the Earth. However, you can picture the sun's gravity in the following way. This side of the Earth, for example, which is closer to the sun than this side, well, there is a slightly greater gravitational force exerted on this side of the Earth as opposed to this side of the Earth, which is a little bit further away from the sun. So let me go ahead and draw in those force vectors. Let's say that right here, for example, is a force vector I'll call F1, and then right over here is a force vector F2. Okay, the force vector F1 is greater than F2 because we're talking about the gravitational force exerted on the near side of the Earth here, as opposed to the far side. Remember, the force of gravity depends on distance. So F1 is greater than F2. Okay, now right here at the center of the Earth, like so, this right here will picture then, of course, as where the axis of rotation is passing through the center of the Earth. Let's take a look at now the moment arms associated with the two force vectors, F1 and F2. So there's a moment arm that goes from here to here, for example, which is just equal to the radius of the Earth, by the way, going to this location here where F1 is being applied. Notice that the angle between that moment arm, like so, and F1 is zero degrees. So sine of zero is zero, therefore F1 does not exert a torque. Okay, now for F2, which is here on the back side of the Earth, right here is the moment arm, like so. Notice that the angle between that moment arm and F2 is 180 degrees, the sine of 180 degrees is equal to zero as well, therefore F2 does not exert a torque. 
So if the Earth is a perfect sphere, then F1 and F2, basically the sun's gravity on one side of the Earth as opposed to the other, well, no torque is exerted upon the Earth. So then therefore that Earth would not process. But the Earth is not a perfect sphere. As it rotates due to centrifugal force, it bulges a little bit at the equator. The Earth's equatorial radius is not that much larger than the polar radius. It's only larger by about 20 kilometers or so. The way that we mathematically model it is to picture a ring of material going around the Earth at the Earth's equator where the radius of that ring is a little bit bigger than the Earth's polar radius. That ring of material that's bulging outwards from the Earth's equator, by the way, is sometimes referred to as the Earth's girdle. I know that's kind of a cute term to refer to it as, but that's what it's called in the context of this problem. So let's now take the Earth's girdle into account here on this diagram. So I'm going to change a few things here. Okay, so now first of all, the Earth bulges at the equator as it rotates. Okay, so then therefore the Earth's equatorial radius is a little bit bigger than the polar radius resulting in the girdle. So the equatorial radius is a little bigger, not by much, 20 kilometers or so, than the polar radius. Okay, the girdle has a mass. The mass of the girdle is very small compared to the overall mass of the Earth. But because the Earth does bulge at the equator, resulting in the girdle, this then changes the locations of the application of the forces F1 and F2. That then has to adjust this diagram in the following way. Okay, so of course you'll redraw the diagram in your notes. So let me go ahead and do some erasing here like so. Okay, let me redraw this line here for the ecliptic like this. But now, as the Earth bulges at the equator resulting in the girdle, then the force F1 is actually applied at this location, like so. And then the force F2 is applied at this location, like so. Essentially, these two force vectors are parallel to each other. You can picture the Sun, for example, as being infinitely far away on this diagram for simplicity. We still have, however, F1 greater than F2. Okay, notice that the angle now between the moment arms and the force vectors is no longer just zero or 180 degrees. It's in fact in terms of the angle theta. So let's say that we take a look at this moment arm right here for F1. Okay, so here's that moment arm, which is just the radius of the Earth. Here's the force vector F1. And then right here is the angle theta. And now do R cross F. When you do, you end up with a torque vector that's out of the board. Like so, we'll call that tau 1. Okay, now in magnitude, tau 1 is the radius of the Earth times F1 times sine theta. Like so. Okay, now let's do the same thing on the back side of the Earth over here. That is the back side of the girdle. Right here is the moment arm, like so. That's once again the radius of the Earth. Here's F2, like this. And then we need the angle here in between those two vectors. In terms of theta, it's actually pi minus theta. Let me do a little bit of geometry. And now let's go ahead and do R cross F. When you do R cross F, you end up with a torque vector, call it tau 2, that's into the board. So here's tau 2. Okay, we'll go ahead and make that negative. Okay, so tau 2, use the radius of the Earth. F2 sine of pi minus theta. If you do a trig identity, by the way, of sine of pi minus theta, it's the same thing as just the sine of theta. And this is negative. So this is negative R sub e, F2 sine theta, like so. Okay, now let's go ahead and add two quantities together to get the net torque. Okay, so the net torque is gonna be this positive number here, plus that negative number there. And because F1 is greater than F2, this number is a bigger number than this number. Therefore, the net torque vector is going to be a positive number. The net torque vector is going to point out of the board. So here's then how you can visualize it. 
As the Earth rotates on its axis like so, from west to east, and then here's the North Pole, as it's doing it like so, you then end up with a net torque vector that's out of the board. So then therefore, kind of much like my stick, which is a little bit easier to model, by the way, but much like my stick like so, then that then means that the Earth is going to persess. It's going to persess like this as it rotates. Once again, the net torque vector in our orientation like so is out of the board. Therefore, the delta L vector is out of the board, and then therefore it processes like this. The rate of precession is extremely slight. The reason why is because, first of all, there's not much difference between these two numbers, and the forces F1 and F2 are small to begin with. The reason why is because F1 and F2 depend upon the mass of the girdle, and the mass of the girdle is extremely small compared to the overall mass of the Earth. So suffice it to say, this net torque number here, when you crunch all the numbers themselves, is pretty small. The rate of precession is actually a pretty famous number. It's 26,000 years. That's how long it takes the Earth to process. So capital T precession, precession, is equal to about 26,000 years. Okay, here's how it's noticeable. I'll describe this in the context of the seasons. So for example, let's say that I draw out what the situation looks like in the present day. Okay, let's say that right here is the sun. Let's say here's the earth on one day of the year and I'm gonna draw it like this, North Pole, South Pole, and the equator. And then let me draw it over here on the other side of the sun. Equator, North Pole, and South Pole, like so. Notice that I'm keeping the angle that the Earth's axis, or the Earth's equator, is tilted with respect to the ecliptic the same. Okay, now let's go ahead and describe which day is which. We'll think of this in terms of the solstices, June 21st and December 21st. So which day is which? This is where I'll go ahead and model it for us now by using my light bulb. Okay, and then I have my Earth here, and I've drawn here on my Earth an equator for reference. Now let's go ahead and tilt it like this here on that side of the diagram. And then let's say, for example, that you're standing here in the northern hemisphere like so, and it's noon at your location on this day. Okay, notice that you would look at the sun like so at noon and you would see it extremely high in the sky. Let's say that this corresponds to June 21st, which is what is called the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere. The meaning, by the way, of the summer solstice is as follows. Take the Earth's equator and project it onto the sky like so to end up with what is called the celestial equator. Notice that the light bulb, the sun, is very far north of the celestial equator. The sun reaches its northernmost extent north of the celestial equator on June 21st, which is the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere. Okay, now let's go six months later, boom, 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 like so. Notice that I kept the equator tilted exactly the same way as I did on the other side of the diagram, hence this drawing here. And now let me rotate the pencil once again so it's new. Notice that I kept it tilted exactly the same way as I had earlier, like so. So then therefore, if you're right here at the location of the pencil at noon, notice that the sun is really low in the sky. So that's gonna correspond the winter. Let's say that this is December 21st. So then therefore, the meaning of that solstice is as follows. Take the Earth's equator and project it onto the sky to get the celestial equator, and it's up here, and notice that the light bulb is very far south of the celestial equator. It reaches its southernmost extent south of the celestial equator on December 21st, which is the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere. The seasons, of course, are reversed in the southern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, that would be the summer solstice. So this is December 21st right here. Let's say that this is March 21st. On March 21st, notice the location of the light bulb, the sun, in relation to the celestial equator. It's crossing the celestial equator. This is the spring or vernal equinox. And then we get to here, June 21st once again, which is the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. It's winter in the Southern Hemisphere. And then let's say that we get to the other equinox like so, which is on September 23rd. 
on September 23rd, you take the Earth's equator and project it onto the sky, and it intersects the light bulb. The light bulb, the sun, is crossing the celestial equator on that day. That's the autumnal equinox. And then we get back to here for December 21st for a full year. That's basically a description, very simply, of the seasons. So then, therefore, on my diagram behind me, this right here, we'll say is June 21st, and this right over here is December 21st. But remember that the Earth's axis is precessing. So then therefore, 13,000 years from now, the seasons will be reversed. 13,000 years from now, let me write it like this. One half of the precession has occurred. Therefore, the Earth's axis of rotation is not going to point in this direction like so on the celestial sphere. It's instead going to point in a different direction. It's going to point like this. Northern, southern poles like so. Earth's equator. Notice that the axis of rotation is pointed at a different point on the celestial sphere. Over here, like so. North, south equator, like so, pointed in the same direction. However, notice that the seasons are reversed. Here's the northern hemisphere, so then therefore June 21st is going to be the winter solstice 13,000 years from now, and then on December 21st, here's the northern hemisphere, that's going to be the summer solstice. So the way that we see this in the sky is very slowly over time, the positions of the stars relative to the celestial equator and the celestial poles is slightly changing over time. The amount of change per year is next to nothing. I think it's in the neighborhood of like a, just a couple of arc seconds. An arc second is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. So the processional rate is certainly not going to be very noticeable over the course of a human lifetime, but it does start to be noticeable over the course of centuries. And since the beginnings of recorded history, more than 10,000 years ago, for example, we see that there are differences in how the sky looked like 10,000 years ago as opposed to today. And we know that from astronomical records, for example, that were taken by, say, like the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks built their pyramids such that they pointed windows in the corners on their pyramids in certain directions in the sky. Well, it corresponded to what the sky looked like 8,000 years ago or whenever it was that the pyramids were first starting to be constructed. So over the course of human history, we have noticed precession, and we now, of course, have a physical explanation for it.